uh, critique conference uh, on the triptych uh, is uh, echoed by the uh, presence on this list of Flaubert's Three Tales, which turns out to be a triptych. Uh, and I'll also be talking uh, a good deal this time about representation and the space of representation, which is uh, something I began to do last, uh, last spring or two, two springs ago. Uh, March 76. March uh, 76. Um, so for me, this is uh, a, uh, a coherent, uh, a continuous kind of um, uh, dialogue. And um, uh, I hope that uh, there'll be some coherence for you, too. I, uh, I think, first of all, maybe I could suggest that some people could move over here. There's a lot of empty space here. There seems to be some psychological reason why this side of the room is, is filled up as close to the door, I guess. But, uh, um, or maybe if you could go down that way, uh, I won't feel I have to turn around or look behind my back and, and uh, see if people are hearing me. And in fact, um, uh, if you don't hear me, I'm not sure yet just what the acoustics of this room are like. Uh, say so, and, and I'll, I'll speak up. I'm facing down this way to look at my notes, so I probably won't always project that way. Uh, OK, let me uh, then on these uh, practical things first. Uh, yes, I think I'll try to uh, make these Thursday sessions um, relatively more uh, continuous on the on the uh, supposition that both Owen and I have had that probably more people can come to an afternoon session than a morning one. Uh, and it would follow then, um, if this can be worked out, uh, and it can't always, uh, it would follow then that it would be um, uh, more appropriate in a Friday morning session when there are less people to do closer readings of texts and so forth. But it may not always work out that way. Um, I think uh, uh, this, this list is very much uh, approximative, that is, uh, much will depend on how, on the kind of progress we make in it, but I think it can stand at least as, a, um, uh, as an indication of the order of, of topics. Uh, the next quarter's list, uh, as I recall, will have readings from Telkel, from uh, uh, Mashre Althusser, Baudrillard, uh, insofar as we have translations of these things. And um, in um, uh, primary literary texts, we'll be doing, uh, I think we'll probably still be, we'll be doing some of these things, Flaubert and Conrad, and then uh, also uh, some Wyndham Lewis uh, narratives. So that, uh, as you can see already, uh, the, um, the rhythm of this uh, seminar, but also one of the formal problems of it for me and, and probably for you too, uh, will be in the movement back and forth between different kinds of texts. That is, I'd like uh, as much as possible as a kind of outside uh, um, uh, limit and, and, and ambition uh, for us to be dealing with uh, not only with um, text, but with issues and with problems, um, if not uh, in a philosophical, then at least a, a theoretical way. Uh, as a kind of lower limit, uh, we have the texts themselves. Uh, for example, uh, Les Mots et les Choses, The Order of Things of Foucault. Uh, and so uh, if we don't uh, grapple in any satisfactory way with the problems, uh, at least uh, as a kind of uh, lower uh, limit and uh, still a very respectable ambition, I would think, we can try to understand what's going on uh, in these individual works, which are of some difficulty and complication. Um, and then, um, uh, but those are already two uh, two kinds of um, two kinds of uh, considerations. That is, uh, we're going to have to be shifting back and forth from uh, the whole problem, from the general problems that are raised. Uh, some of them I've listed here on the board. I'll come back to them. But for example problems of representation, of the nature of the subject, uh, things of that kind, and uh, specific considerations about the work of Foucault, because I think it's not, it's not possible immediately to translate this book. This is a history of a very, of a limited and precise period. Uh, it's not uh, possible to immediately pass from discussing what Foucault is doing in this book and how it relates to his, his own uh, work, and some of that, uh, some of the more recent work of Foucault will want to refer to, because that, uh, cast some interesting light back on this. Uh, it's not pass possible to pass from uh, detailed considerations of the work of a theorist of that kind to these general, uh, to these general problems uh, 
without a certain number of what uh, I've also indicated on this board here and, and another list of terms, without a certain number of mediations, and we'll want to come back to that and see what those might be. Now, besides those two kinds of things, general problems uh, of, a, of a theoretical type, specific questions and investigations of the work of certain of these writers, certain of these theorists, certain of these philosophers, we also have um, uh, a certain number of literary texts. Uh, and I think there, too, uh, it won't be a question of applying Foucault to Flaubert, which in any case would be, uh, would be difficult to do uh, in itself without some form of mediations or adaptations of, of one kind or another. Uh, nor will it be possible to avoid reading Flaubert in the, in, in the detail of, of, uh, of his own narrative text before we put Flaubert in, uh, in contact uh, or, or juxtapose Flaubert, place Flaubert in the perspective of, of some of these more general problems. Uh, so uh, a there'll be a certain amount of shifting of gears uh, of that kind. For example, I, I think it would be, I'd like to try uh, during this visit uh, since otherwise these things remain fairly abstract, to at least get to, to, uh, to a reading of a few passages of Flaubert tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, passages of, of, from, uh, from the Three Tales, from uh, Un Cœur Simple, from A Simple Heart. Um, but uh, those will necessarily, uh, again, involve something of a shift in perspective. So that will be happening, I think, throughout. Now, uh, I, to anticipate, it seems to me that pretty clearly um, the, these uh, literary texts, they are Flaubert, Conrad, uh, and Lewis, um, are texts which, uh, whose sequence uh, immediately uh, suggests uh, a problem, an historical problem, namely the emergence of what's sometimes called modernism. Uh, and that will certainly be uh, the, uh, that's certainly the framework in which um, uh, in which I want to, uh, in which I want to look at these, um, uh, look at these texts, but uh, it remains to be seen first how uh, the, the the theorists that we're going to be looking at, uh, what relationship to them this problem of modernism might have. Uh, in the case of Foucault, for example, uh, as I hope we'll come to see even this afternoon, uh, the. Uh, the, the content, the story that's being told in this history, for it's a history, um, it has to do with the emergence of the modern world, with the emergence of something uh, which he doesn't call modernism, but which we can. Uh, and so uh, there's clearly a, uh, a fairly direct relationship between what Foucault is addressing himself to and certain of the questions which we can ask uh, about these, um, these literary texts. Uh, for some, in, for in the case of some of the other theorists, that may not be, it may not be quite so, so direct. Okay, so much then for a, for a warning uh, about the, um, some of the discontinuities in, in, uh, in the things we're going to be doing. Uh, I guess I should add to that a kind of warning about the reflexivity of all this. That is, uh, one of the subjects of many of these writers, in particular Foucault, is discontinuity. So. Uh, this all sort of folds back into, uh, into the content of, of, um, uh, of some of these works. Uh, I'm going to indicate some more general, um, some more, I'm going to indicate uh, right now um, the themes of um, post-structuralism, if one can use that term and if that corresponds to anything, to, to something historical uh, uh, that, that one can identify. Uh, and then I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to indicate some of the themes, uh, my versions of those themes, or at least uh, the perspectives that I'm going to want to re-examine uh, these themes or reevaluate them in, in, in the terms of this uh, prospectus that Owen uh, uh, read to you. Uh, I call these classic works uh, partly because uh, some of them look very different even at this even at this uh, not too distant uh, uh, time uh, gap, uh, Les Moyes Les Choses appeared, I think, in 66, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, already, uh, I think uh, one can reread it. Uh, uh, Foucault has changed in the light of his later work. This book looks very different. Uh, 
Uh, our own situation has changed, and this book has a different meaning for us, and I would add uh, that I read this myself in a somewhat different way than I did uh, when I mentioned it in, uh, in the Prison House of Language, if any of you have seen that, that uh, very brief discussion. So, uh, so there is a process of reevaluation. Now, uh, uh, the, other, um, the other feature of all this is that one doesn't, uh, and it's unavoidable, and again, this is, there's something reflexive about saying so, because this is what we're going to watch Foucault doing in a little while. Uh, once you uh, sketch in, even for the convenience of exposition, uh, a, um, a, a category of periodization. So you say, all right, uh, let's say that uh, something like classical structuralism ended, in the, uh, ended around 67, 68, uh, and that all of these, the work that these people have done, uh, have done since uh, can be uh, in one way or another pulled together in a, in, under the very general category of post-structuralism. Uh, um, once one does that, obviously there's a kind of logic in the process which suggests that now you're beyond that too because obviously you're standing at a point from which you can look back and characterize that as a finished period. And so... Um, uh, so there may be something unavoidable in, uh, in, that, uh, in, in that very logic of periodization, and indeed that's one of the, the, the subjects that I want uh, to discuss uh, and that I want to illustrate first uh, by beginning with, uh, with, Foucault's, um, with Foucault's book. Um, there are a lot of other posts. There's postmodernism, and it would seem that there's a, there's a general feeling that uh, we ought to be able to characterize this period now as being one in which um, not only we've gone beyond a whole set of uh, themes that people used to think of as themes of modernism uh, or of structuralism or whatever, uh, but uh, that we ought, ought to also be able to make up the theory of that and thus uh, somehow find out where, where all this is tending. Uh, and I think that's, it's, this is a legitimate outside horizon for, uh, for the kinds of questions we're going to be asking here. That is, uh, ultimately, it seems to me, um, uh, this, the logic of these terms, uh, uh, as a prophetic logic, may not be, uh, may not be uh, valid. That is, uh, we may not be in a position to say whether anything is emerging. Maybe nothing's emerging. Maybe just everything is falling to pieces or something. But... Uh, nonetheless, uh, as a problem, uh, we ought to be able to um, uh, we ought to be able to reach some kinds of uh, uh, we ought to be able to map out at least uh, the questions to be asked about uh, the the sense of a uh, of a uh, of a historical period uh, and about. Um, uh, what's what's happening uh, now, not only in intellectual history but in history generally, and how this uh, projects a kind of feeling of time and of change, which is rather different from anything that uh, that people had before, even in the early um, uh, even in the early uh, modern period. And indeed, uh, when we look at Foucault uh, uh, as a uh, as a kind of um, as a kind of investigation of this uh, problem, as one version of a theory of what uh, the modern world is and where it came from, we can see that uh, it's something that has tended to repeat itself. That is, uh, the, uh, uh, the key period, what ought to be the key period for him, it's not really, uh, is, uh, is the passage from the 18th century to something which is uh, much more generally characterized as, uh, uh, as the 19th and early 20th centuries, but in other words, uh, there the kind of key period would be uh, that of the revolution and of romanticism. Now, uh, our terminology, uh, that of modernism, suggests that there's another, uh, there's another transitional period uh, equally decisive and fundamental, and certainly which has left uh, its mark on, uh, at least on, the, on, uh, on aesthetics and on the forms that, that we experience. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's the emergence of, of, uh, of modernism in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And finally, uh, it would seem that uh, we're entitled to, to uh, say that either even that is past and finished and something else is emerging, which is postmodern or post, post everything, uh, or at least that that movement is uh, reproducing itself today with the effect that uh, many of the things which were felt to be new and different and breaks with the past have now become our past, so that the classics of modernism uh, 
uh, are no longer subversive, revolutionary, and so on, but rather they're what we study, they're the canon, and, and so forth. Uh, and now uh, what, um, uh, what people look to as a, as a break uh, with those things is, is, is somehow some kind of qualitative leap, if that can be, if that can be imagined. Uh, okay, now I, what I want to do uh, first then is to uh, say something about, um, uh, about what I've called postmodernism, defend a little bit this idea that there is such a thing because uh, a lot of people are, are indignant uh, at this uh, notion and feel that, um, well, it's all very well to talk about Foucault and, and Deleuze and Lyotard, say, as being postmodernist, but we mustn't include Derrida in that or vice versa, we mustn't include someone else in this, uh, and of course, uh, uh, from a from a point from a technical philosophical standpoint, uh, this is perfectly justified, and there is a, a way of reading and a and a and a focus in which um, uh, in which all of these writers are uh, are different from each other and have different problems, and and, and in which such a uh, characterization is abusive and and uh, shouldn't uh, arise at all. But uh, I think it's fair, at least uh, as a uh, as a kind of preliminary. Uh, background and, 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 and framework for ourselves to, um, to sketch in a kind of myth or fable uh, of, their, uh, of, uh, of, of what they share, uh, particularly in as much as we'll have occasion to read them in some detail, and uh, at that point uh, we can decide if we've been unjust and, and really uh, want to abandon this category. Uh, and decide that there really never was such a thing as post-structuralism. Uh, they have nothing in common, uh, and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that uh, it's not uh, terribly abusive to, to begin with a with a kind of uh, with a kind of uh, um, character, kind of general characterization uh, of the of the kind I want to propose. Um, I guess. Um, even before that, one would have to say something about uh, not just about theories, post-structural theories, but about theory uh, itself. Uh, it is an odd word. Uh, I think uh, probably, although we'll be talking a great deal about literature, it's probably not correct anymore to say that uh, not only the things I'm going to do here, but uh, but these works uh, themselves are, uh, are examples of literary theory, even when they address themselves to literature, as Foucault does at key moments in his, in his text. Uh, rather, it seems to me that theory as such is, is a new kind of, um, uh, and this is a little bit the ideology of the theorists who would like to think that this is something new. So uh, again, this is a characterization that we may want to discard later on if we, if we change our minds. But uh, at any rate, I think it's fair to say that theory is, is, um, is something relatively, um, uh, relatively new in the sense which is no longer philosophy as such, no longer technical philosophy, although some of these people are philosophers, uh, not all of them. Um, it's no longer, uh, by the same token, uh, it's no longer uh, uh, aesthetics either, which is a branch of technical philosophy, the study of, of beauty and the beautiful uh, as a branch of, uh, of, of those realities which used to be divided in the classical way as, the, the, uh, as uh, activity, um, uh, knowledge, and uh, um, and aesthetics, or the good, the true, and the beautiful, uh, or ethics, uh, ethics, epistemology, and aesthetics. Uh, it seems to me uh, this, uh, this notion of theory cuts across all of those things uh, and leaves none of them intact. Uh, it, would seem to come, it would seem to have several sources of which the most important is, uh, is a new feeling about language itself. Uh, it being understood that uh, this theory, the theory in the general way that I'm using it now, uh, is not uh, linguistics either. Uh, and that uh, what, the, what the professional linguists do may be material for lots of analogies that are used in, 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 um, in, in this kind of uh, writing. But, uh, but it can't be thought that, uh, that what's being done even in the most linguistically conscious of them is, uh, is linguistics anymore, which is a science, and theory is somehow something other than that. Now, uh, again, uh, what I'm saying is going to turn out to be sort of reflexive because Foucault is himself, in this book that we're going to be studying, concerned with things, with precisely this question, that is, what are the human sciences, that's one of the, or the Geisteswissenschaften, that's the very, uh, 
polemic thrust of his book. Uh, what is the role, what, 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 is, what, is, uh, what is language and the changing attitudes towards language uh, have to do with uh, the emergence of some of these new, uh, new fields, if that's what they are, and he doesn't think all of these things are fields. Uh, and so forth. I want to characterize it myself in this preliminary kind of introduction I'm going to give you today uh, in, a, in a somewhat different way. This, it seems to me certainly uh, what we call theory uh, comes out of a, a, an awareness that um, everything is saturated with language uh, and therefore that it's impossible to separate language out for, from anything anymore. That everything is, uh, to use another one of these, I'll, I'll tell you what these words are in a minute. I'm sorry they, they're not visible very well, but I, but I think you can use them as a checklist rather, and it sort of is comforting to me to have something written down. I don't know why. Um, uh, these, uh, this, what I'm calling theory, what, what we can call theory, um, emerges from a sense that a language is no longer something that you study in one place uh, and then the other fields define themselves off in a, in a, um, uh, in a fairly, uh, in a way which makes each of them accessible to specialization so that then you can have uh, your study of, um, uh, of literary works uh, and you can have your, your study of social relations, uh, anthropology and so on but rather feeling that um, all of these things are language phenomena, and in that sense, they begin to fold into each other. Uh, and moreover, that there is no, the 19th century, uh, after all, was, was uh, at positivism in particular, uh, had a, um, and in a sense, uh, I guess Foucault would see this as a kind of modification of the earlier uh, classical 18th, 17th, and 18th, 18th century notion of, a, of universal, um, of a kind of universal grammar and universal knowledge, metesis, methesis, as he calls it. Uh, 19th, the 19th century, imagine uh, in, uh, in among the, the various um, thoughts or, or pro projects, projections, programs of, of positivism, a kind of universal super or meta science uh, under which all of the other fields would be somehow ranged in a hierarchical way such that uh, at this pinnacle, and it would presumably be occupied by, Kant calls it philosophie positive, by positive philosophy, so philosophy would still have a place and it would be precisely the function of philosophy, to occupy this, um, uh, this organizing uh, role of the consciousness of method of all of the other sciences. Well, seems to me, uh, clearly that never happened, uh, and most of the most interesting theories of, of um, of science today, I think of Bachelard, but there are a lot of other ones, uh, have tried to point out that uh, the point about contemporary science is that this is un, that the various contemporary sciences, uh, if you want to use that word for all of them, are ununifiable and they're all going in different directions and they have no kind of rate of development that you could even uh, compare uh, uh, with each other and they're not homologous. Uh, and so the very concept of a super science uh, of a positive philosophy um, was, uh, was misconceived. Well, this being the case, but it also then being the case for us uh, who have, in one phrase people like to use, discovered the symbolic that has discovered uh, that everything is symbolic, uh, that, that everything is a sign system or everything involves a language in a much more thoroughgoing way than, uh, than the positivists could ever have thought. Uh, for us, then, there is a kind of a unity of all these, well, there is, a, there is a kind of homogeneity of all these things, but it can't be, um, it can't be theorized in a, uh, from the outside. There isn't a privileged place from which you could make a, uh, a super science of, uh, the, of these various science systems, although uh, one type of contemporary theory, semiotics, has, uh, has tried to do that, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so that being the case, uh, what one does then is try to uh, project a kind of theoretical self-consciousness of any given area uh, of, of, uh, of, of this vast activity which is the human, the human sciences, whether it is uh, the study of, of primitive societies, the study of literary texts, the study of, uh, of daily life or, of, uh, or even of uh, um, the famous semiotic example, the um, uh, the the, uh, the traffic uh, manual and and the um, and the uh, signals in the, in in the street, uh, 
at, w at whatever point uh, one uh, studies any of these local uh, fields, nonetheless, some kinds of generalization take place which then have a resonance that, that crosses over all the other boundaries. So that uh, this, uh, if, if, if a book like uh, Foucault's uh, Order of Things had been written oh, 50 years ago, and, and I'm sure it was written then, and, and we could find in, um, among the classic history of, histories of ideas, uh, older versions of this whose, whose uh, basic story is not a new one. I mean, he's talking about the passage from what used to be called a kind of mechanistic worldview to, to uh, what was then called an organic worldview. Well, that's a, that's a very old story in the history of ideas that's been told over and over again in a lot of forms. But when it was told before, the books that told that story were only interesting uh, to the people who were interested in that subject. That is, they had no more general uh, uh, resonance or, or implication. Uh, and if you were interested then in the, uh, in the transition from uh, the 18th century worldview to that of Romanticism, you would read such a history. And, but it, it, it's very conceivable that uh, since there are lots of fields of study and lots of specializations, that might not be your field. And then uh, you might know about this classic work, but it might not be of any interest to you. Well, in the case of Foucault, uh, or this kind of theoretical book, uh, that's no longer true. And uh, uh, this, in a sense, uh, sends off its vibrations uh, in ways that are not at all limited to this, um, uh, to this field, because, what, what, uh, because a, a whole set of problems are being, um, uh, are be, are being how can I put it, uh, not uh, dealt with definitively, but are being activated and uh, allowed to play, uh, to, to play out certain uh, dynamics that they have uh, in, a, in a way which makes of this uh, a, um, uh, an exemplary uh, work uh, in, 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 in many ways that, that go beyond uh, the, the particular historical period in, um, in question. Well, uh, that's one way of talking about theory. Uh, and I think it's not wrong, but there's another way one has to mention, uh, and that has to do, I think, with the historical uh, appearance of these of these things, these meta books, these uh, these uh, me meta theories, <coughs> whatever they are, um, because I think that uh, this is a relatively uh, new form, not only of um, thinking but also of discourse. This kind of book, <coughs> and I think this will be much clearer to you when you read uh, Deleuze, the, the anti-Oedipus, uh, then here, because Foucault uh, has a certain uh, discipline and sobriety about him, but uh, when you come to the Deleuze uh, Guattari uh, book, you'll see that this is a, a, a form of a, of a rather different type, this kind of theoretical discourse, than, uh, than what we're used to, and certainly then was presented in, in, the, um, in classical philosophy, in, in a treatise of Heidegger or of Sard or Husserl or, or, or whatever. These are effectively, uh, uh, if you pardon this sort of barbaric expression, meta books, that is their theories, this kind of theory is a theory which comes out of other theories. And I think uh, it's not at all, a, it's not, uh, not at all just a figure of speech or a metaphor to say that uh, this, these things come out of a kind of uh, to to, to re recapitulate, if you like, uh, the Rostovian development theory and say there's a kind of um, takeoff, there's a kind of accumulation period uh, for these theoretical things. And then, as with uh, the de development and underdevelopment, uh, there's a, there's a uh, kind of primitive accumulation of, of industrialization, capital, and so on. And then there's a takeoff period in which uh, an underdeveloped country, according to Rostov, then becomes a developed country. It's a question whether that really happens. but. Uh, uh, something like that seems to be seems to happen in um, in uh, in the uh, emergence of this new thing which we're calling theory. That is, there's a kind of primitive accumulation of of theories, all different from each other. Uh, for example, in Deleuze, you'll see uh, it's a whole one could one could do a whole course around his references. I mean, they they design a whole new kind of canon of of uh, of, of history that one could set up. Uh, you have uh, you have Mumford, uh, you have stuff about modern art, you have uh, uh, philosophy, obviously, uh, new literary references which are anti-canonical, that is, not, uh, not books in the canon, but rather uh, uh, books which are uh, somehow subversive, like Bataille or Klosowski or, or, or people like that, Artaud. Uh, 
Uh, you and and the, and the whole thing uh, uh, designs uh, as it goes along a a, 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 sphere, a sphere of references which is really uh, which are the, the the primitive theoretical capital from which these new statements on which all, on which these new statements draw. Uh, so that's a, that's a rather new thing, and clearly uh, it has to do with something in the development of intellectual life which wasn't, which wasn't there before. Uh, you would think uh, that, uh, that activity which called itself theory uh, would then place some uh, unusual premium and, and high uh, uh, value on, uh, on the theoretical, the conceptual, the abstract. You could look at it just the other way around, though, and say uh, that theory comes about when suddenly um, uh, writers, thinkers, or people, or whatever, uh, realize that um, theories are infinitely substitutable, and that uh, one can one does not have to remain the prisoner of one system or one um, uh, one code. To use some terms, I'm going to come back to in a minute, but rather, uh, but rather can. Um, uh, pass from one of these to the other uh, in a way which uh, may involve inventing a new language, new kind of private discourse of some kind, uh, but which certainly involves uh, learning a whole new way of, of, uh, uh, of living among these various systems and abstractions. Uh, the word I've put on the board for that, I guess it's one of the more visible ones, um, which is something that we want to uh, that we're going to no doubt uh, have occasion to talk about again in, in a number of ways is transcoding, uh, or uh, there's a word that Peirce uh, uses, which Umberto Eco has recently uh, 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 re revived and, and I think very usefully uh, uh, called semiosis, which is the same uh, idea of passing from one sign system to another, transcoding, moving from one code uh, to another code. Now, um, this was not, I think, uh, the way that certainly the philosophers proceeded uh, even in the early modern era because the point about, uh, seems to me, about professional philosophy, if you think then of the, the various kinds of systems as they, they succeed each other, you have phenomenology, which is a movement which tries to uh, in, invent a, 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 a supple but somehow binding uh, a terminology for, for dealing with its objects. Uh, or, uh, or Heideggerian existentialism or Sartre or whatever, when you think of any one of those systems, you see an effort to somehow uh, create a, uh, a set of terms which, are, uh, which have a certain permanence about them, right? That is, which are, uh, which, uh, which are uh, demonstrated to, to, to do the job better than the rival terminologies. Uh, whose, uh, whose uh, insufficiencies are criticized and, and pointed out and so on. And so there's still a kind of um, uh, an, an attempt to uh, um, invent an absolute language, let's say. A language which is a set of terms, or a code, as we would say now, a code which is somehow better than the other ones, uh, more universally binding, more satisfactory, uh, which more permanent. Once you learn it, uh, then you become a Heideggerian or a phenomenologist or a Sartrean, and that's that. And, uh, and then you fight against the other codes and so on. But there's a kind of feeling of a commitment to this uh, to this code uh, for on, on account of what it what it can do, uh, which is not unlike really what goes on in, in modern which what has gone on in, in modern literature itself in modern in classical modernism, in which uh, you have the same uh, attempt to to invent a set of symbols, uh, which has a kind of finality to it uh, and into which the reader is slowly initiated symbols which are somehow uh, um, uh, which are in in commensurate uh, and incompatible with the symbols of other writers. So when you work your way into Lawrence's work, uh, if you read Lawrence properly, you become a Laurentian, you adopt those symbols, uh, the, whole, the reading of one book after another is a progressive kind of initi initiation. And these symbols are not something that you can um, mix up with uh, those of, uh, of, uh, of Joyce or, or, or Lewis or Pound or something. I mean, they don't give rise to other to syntheses. You can't translate them into something else. They make their own absolute demands. And the, each of these, uh, each of the great modernist writers, uh, 
uh, it seems to me, uh, has, has, had, uh, has been informed by this attempt to <coughs> invent a kind of um, ultimate code or ultimate book, a book of the world, uh, which would replace all the others, <coughs> uh, which was incompatible with the others, uh, and which was uh, demanded a kind of centrality. Now, obviously, uh, one of the contradictions of that modernism uh, is that um, when everybody is doing it, then, uh, then clearly that's the one moment when you can't have a <coughs> universal code. It's possible to imagine a cultural situation in which uh, someone, either a, a, either a writer or a philosopher, by some probably less personal accident than a, than a whole uh, uh, coming together of circumstances, and Aristotle, say, or Dante, or St. Thomas, uh, finally writes out something which is going to become for, for, a, for a collectivity and over a long period of time uh, a central reference point and a central code. But, uh, but if uh, the, the efforts of, uh, of everybody in a situation like that of the early modern period are uh, aimed at um, inventing just such a code, then it's clear that, uh, that it can never happen and that what you have on the contrary uh, is uh, rather a kind of multiplicity of, of, of these absolute codes which are sort of indistinguishable from, uh, from private languages in that sense. Well, it uh, seems to me that, um, to come back then to theory, that modern philosophy tries to do this still, uh, and that uh, what we're calling theory then um, gets out of the, 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 the problem in a very different way simply by but it may not be so simple, uh, simply by abandoning the effort at, at creating absolute codes, uh, and also riding on the existence now of lots of these codes right, in, all of the, in all of the fields, uh, uh, the existence of lots of theories which were painfully worked out to be the truth, but which now turn out to be a lot of private languages. So, so at a certain point in uh, philosophy, you look back and you see that all of a sudden uh, there are lots of philosophical systems, all of which can function like private languages, which you can translate back and forth into each other. Uh, uh, and the same would be true uh, in, other, in other fields, anthropology, uh, sociology, and so on. Uh, and at that point, then, a new kind of activity c c comes into being, which I think is, is very important for us to grasp on, on all levels. That is, uh, on a very practical level of, um, of, uh, of study, um, it seems to me that life, intellectual life uh, t today uh, um, uh, demands uh, that uh, our students um, learn, that, that, that demands a, a rather different kind of skill from what was demanded uh, uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, it demands precisely a kind of skillfulness in transcoding and in being able uh, being able to let go of the terms of a certain private language and pass to another one, or a certain public language, if you like, and pass to another one relatively effortlessly, or at least to sense that much of what's interesting lies uh, in, the, in the difficulties of transcoding and lies in the area in which these two codes sort of fail to mesh, rather than uh, the kinds of um, intellectual skills that were demanded before when um, oh, let's say there was a master who had a certain language which he taught to a disciple who then mastered it, and the best disciples were the ones who really uh, were the most at home in that particular absolute uh, language. So this is another, uh, another reason for the emergence of theory, and it's a quite different one, as you see. Uh, I would be tempted to go, even though it's just not, but it's not my theory, really. Uh, there is a, a theory about these... Um, uh, about these modern theories, uh, and it is uh, one uh, that we owe to one of the people we'll have a look at probably second semester, a sociologist, Jean Baudrillard, uh, who uh, suggests this, that just as, uh, now this is his point of view, it's not entirely mine, uh, just as uh, something fundamental happens in the passage from the classical market society to what we call a uh, consumer society, or the Société de Consommation. That is, in the still, in the conditions of relative scarcity of developing capitalism, developing market society, um, you have uh, uh, the brands change very little. The products that you want to exchange for each other uh, are products which essentially um, uh, 
fight their battle on the marketplace, fight out this battle in terms of permanence, durability, and so on. Think just of Victorian furniture, if you like. What you want to buy is something which will last, uh, if not forever, then uh, as, as, long, as close to it uh, as possible, um, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Where uh, in consumer society, um, so that, uh, uh, and this, um, uh, the, the exchange value of these products is therefore uh, uh, very, uh, still very closely tied to their uh, use value. And the, the, if you have this formula, it's a kind of fraction, if you like. Uh, the use value is sort of the, the natural husk or core of the exchange value. Well, Baudrillard, in his, uh, in his uh, cultural critique, if you like, his characterization of the theoretical space of these works we're going to look at, uh, including his own, uh, suggests that this uh, famous um, relationship, exchange value and use value, uh, drawn from Marxism, is now to be uh, compared to uh, another famous uh, fraction, but this one, the so-called semiotic fraction, uh, drawn from um, from, uh, I don't quite have it right, just in English, uh, from uh, uh, linguistics, from Saussurean linguistics, uh, in which you have the signifier over the signified, that is, uh, the, um, the acoustic uh, image, the, the sound of the word, over uh, its, uh, the mental image that accompanies it, its meaning. Uh, this identification of exchange and use value with signifier and signified uh, has some other implications that I don't want to go into right now, but uh, essentially what Baudrillard uh, is brought to is that in consumer society, uh, use value is somehow less and less important, and exchange these uh, the the multiplication of objects uh, leads to a kind of movement of uh, away from this um, uh, identification of exchange and use value uh, towards a substitution of one exchange value for another. So uh, in in um, uh, so before you'd have uh, two or three brands of cigarettes, uh, the advertisers of these things in the 20s, for example, would, uh, the advertisements would be of a great durability. Uh, and they wouldn't change, the, uh, the, the, uh, the style of, uh, of, of cars wouldn't change, and rather it's their non-changingness which made them up as a sign, the Model T Ford, for example, uh, is, uh, is the very sign of its use value because precisely uh, there isn't a styling change. Well, little by little, after everybody has these basic things to begin with, then there gets to be a multiplication of, uh, uh, of uh, a kind of new kind of rhythm which characterizes our society where uh, rather than make them to last, you make them to, to, to be disposable and to, uh, to get rid of them, planned obsolescence. And uh, instead, you substitute uh, each individual uh, product undergoes as many style changes as rapidly as possible. Uh, and these things start to substitute uh, for each other in a way which is utterly uh, un, uh, uh, un, uh, uh, inexplicable in terms of, of, uh, of classical economics. Well, if that's a good description of, that's at least a, a good description of the, of, the, uh, 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 of the phenomenology of consumer society, right? That is, uh, that, uh, that the point is not uh, for a product to last anymore, but rather for it to be caught in a kind of V ever more rapid circuit of substitutions. Well, Baudrillard then, as you have guessed, goes on to say the same is true in the realm of thought. Uh, now, uh, in the realm of a, of a society which is also a consumer society in the intellectual realm, that is a society which is no longer one of types of scarcity or even, uh, 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 or not, not to say under development, but which uh, is ever more, uh, from an intellectual point of view, also an affluent society, uh, then uh, we get something of the same pattern. Uh, a theory is not made to last. Uh, uh, a signifier is not judged in terms uh, of its signified anymore, but rather in terms of its relationship to other signifiers, to its infinite substitutability for them. Uh, and indeed, the object of the game is to invent new ones uh, as rapidly uh, as you can. And I think that describes at least very well um, uh, some aspects of, uh, of, in, of the, intellectual, uh, the intellectual milieu from which some of the books we're going to read come from, namely that of Paris. Uh, 
uh, if not indeed uh, our own, since uh, the process is going on uh, is going on everywhere. So I think uh, something like that has to be understood about uh, about the way in which uh, these various theories emerge. Uh, to replace each other, to comment on each other, the way they emerge out of a kind of primitive uh, accumulation of other theories, um, uh, not as a way of trying to pr provide permanent syntheses of any kind, but as a, as a kind of momentary, uh, as a synthesis, which is also a momentary statement, uh, as a kind of massive, monumental, uh, um, uh, almost Hegelian uh, uh, system, which is also a pamphlet. And that's, uh, that's exactly what Les Moyles Shows is. Uh, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a uh, very rich, richly documented uh, work of, of, of historical scholarship. And on the other hand, it's, a, it's, a pamphlet, it's an ideological pamphlet. Uh, it's an attack on humanism, which, which is to be understood in, in a little bit in the tradition of Althusserus. We'll see in, in, in a little while. Uh, and as such, it's very ephemeral. Uh, and uh, when we're through with the polemic against humanism, uh, this may seem very uh, outdated, uh, and I don't know whether we're through with that yet, but uh, uh, some of those parts already seem dated. Uh, and I think that's characteristic of the, of the, of the focus of, um, of theory. Now, so much then for the notion of, of, uh, of theory. Uh, but I think we still have to say something about post-structuralism. We have to say something about really uh, why why it's French uh, uh, and what its relationships are to other equivalents in other countries, and and I will want to uh, very much uh, uh, construe this uh, this uh, series of of, uh, of seminars as a continuation, in my own terms, of course, of. Uh, of the conference that Owen evoked a while ago, the 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 uh, the conference between uh, hermeneutics and, uh, uh, and semiotics, because I think uh, it's only by opposing this tradition to, uh, to other national and intellectual traditions, such as the German one, for example, among others, uh, that we can get some sense of its specificity. And in any case, uh, we have to do that because um, uh, all of these traditions are foreign to us, and uh, we inherit them in some way which asks us to to transcode them into each other, uh, we're maybe in a better position uh, than are any of the European or the continental uh, uh, intellectual spaces to, um, to see whether it is possible to, um, to uh, work some kind of, um, not synthesis exactly, but, but uh, understand uh, the relationship between uh, and the difference between uh, the problems posed by these, these different traditions. And indeed, I think it's impossible to uh, uh, to study them any other way. Uh, so first, let me say something about uh, post-structuralism um, and this fiction or fable uh, of uh, periodization that I have already mentioned, uh, whereby uh, there once was such a thing as high structuralism or classical structuralism, uh, and then that gave way to what we're looking at now. Um, high structuralism, I, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure quite how one, can, um, how one can describe that in two seconds, uh, except by the, the, uh, the indication of, of, uh, of names. Uh, certainly, it's around uh, Lévi-Strauss that, uh, that ha classical high structuralism is crystallized, and it's in the work of Lévi-Strauss that it's really invented as such. And I think the word structuralism, except as it's been taken up by uh, people like Piaget, who mean something a little different, I think. Uh, the word structuralism is still used by him, and I think nowadays only used by him uh, anymore to describe uh, what he's uh, what he's doing. So that um, uh, so that it is so that it, there too uh, the the work of Levi Strauss is central. Um, <coughs> it is, as you uh, as you're aware, the uh, the application to um, to uh, the study of uh, of primitive cultures of of the, of, of a or several linguistic models, most notably those that he that he got from Jakobsen. Uh, here too, Foucault's book will end up in this place when he says that the the farthest cutting edge of the human sciences in our time are psychoanalysis and ethnology. And what he means by ethnology is clearly Levi's toes. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, what's uh, well, and, and then the other names I think that have to be mentioned are Lacan in, in psychoanalysis, 
uh, also a kind of adaptation of, of, uh, of a very different tradition, all, which had already gone through uh, a certain kind of existential uh, uh, reorganization, the application uh, to that tradition of uh, certain kinds of linguistics. Um, and I guess finally the name one should mention, but this is more complicated, is that of Althusser, uh, who was certainly in that sense the philosopher of classical structuralism, the one who invented the themes which we'll see used here in Foucault, uh, in the Telcal group, uh, even in Derrida, um, but who could also, from another point of view, be seen as a, as a kind of post-structuralist, and, and it's a complicated case that maybe we'll get to in, in the second semester. At any rate, what characterizes at least the first two of, of these um, monuments of, of high structuralism uh, is not just the application of language to, to the field of study in question, but, um, uh, but essentially the ahistorical character of the object of study. The whole point about uh, uh, the study of primitive society for levi strauss the revival of Rousseau, the distinction between hot societies and cold societies, that's the distinction between, it's his, it's his, um, his metaphor between two types of functioning. One would be, um, uh, one would be the, 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 uh, the, the water wheel, say, mechanical functioning, uh, or the water clock, or I don't know. Uh, and the other would be the steam engine, dynamic functioning. Well, for him, uh, there, the human societies can be divided into these two, um, in, into these two types, uh, hot societies, and really, when you think of hot societies, there's only one, that is, it's ours, you know, it's, it's what has become ours, what has become world, uh, world society, uh, 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 a kind of world uh, advanced industrial society, which is, has a dynamic uh, uh, logic to it, which is changing all the time in its very nature. And the other, uh, like a steam engine, in other words, which is producing new energy and constantly modifying its, its, uh, its, its relation, in, in internal relations. Uh, and the other, cold society, whose very purpose is, uh, is not to change, uh, which changes in the sense that individuals die, that a tribe moves on to another place, that, uh, that you have a different kind of vegetation to, to be dealt with and so on, but which wishes to be ahistorical in the sense that uh, all of its, um, all of its um, inner energies are addressed to preventing social change, preventing structural change. Uh, this is, as I said, the, the reason for, uh, um, the, reason for the, the kind of miraculous revival of Rousseau uh, by Lévi-Strauss and then, and, then, and then since as, as the, the, the philosopher, the theoretician of some state of nature which would not be history, which would be other than history. Uh, it's been developed most recently uh, uh, in a very interesting way by a, by a writer who I think uh, his uh, most important book has been translated uh, or is coming out in English, Pierre Plast. He just died recently at the age of 43. Uh, a book called Society Against the State, in which, uh, which is a theory of primitive society in, in which uh, he suggests that the very structure of what we call primitive society uh, is aimed not just at preventing hist uh, history, but also at preventing the accumulation of power, the coming into being of power, the coming into being of centrality, and so on. And it's a very uh, stimulating thesis, and I would say it is, the, it is one of the interesting political offshoots of, uh, of Levi's toast, but it's something uh, rather different from um, uh, except insofar as it's a kind of anarchism, uh, uh, something a little bit different from the people we're going to be uh, looking at. Okay, so in the case of Levi Strauss, then, we have the application of linguistics to something which is non-historical, uh, by definition. Or maybe, but that's never clear in Levi Strauss, maybe we have it, we have the application of linguistics uh, to something which is non-historical because that's the only thing that linguistics would apply to, that is. Uh, but as I say, that's, it's never clear whether uh, for Les Vistos, uh, uh there is some ultimate um, connection between the linguistic model and its fitness and the fact that you have to do with a kind of synchronic system. Well, uh, in the case of Lacan, but who is even more complicated and about whom we really can't, I think, say anything right now, uh, in the case of Lacan, uh, there's at least this much uh, in common, uh, that here too we have a system which is, which is fundamentally ahistorical. The application of language uh, 
uh, to the unconscious uh, and to um, structures which are uh, understood by uh, this, uh, this structural psychoanalysis as being transhistorical, uh, whether it be what Lacan calls the symbolic order, whether it be the, uh, the Oedipal situation, which in his hands is much more complicated than the familiar Freudian one. Nonetheless, these things are thought to be uh, a kind of transhistorical horizon of, uh, of all human life, and therefore something which doesn't change either. Uh, and therefore something which is not accessible to history in our, uh, in our sense. Now, what I want to uh, suggest uh, is uh, uh, that um, post-structuralism comes into being when this whole train of, of, uh, of uh, research and, and theory of various kinds is obliged to confront history. That is, uh, it's clear to any of you who have opened up the book that Foucault is a professional historian. Uh, it's also clear uh, when you look at uh, uh, when you look at the Antiedipus that, um, in however strange a way uh, it may be, this is a, this is a, a vision of history and a theory of history. Uh, and the same is true of all the other people um, uh, that we are going to be dealing with. Uh, you you'll say Derrida may be a kind of exception, but uh, what the, the very um, framework, Derrida is, is always an exception in that uh, when he, uh, whenever he has a position, uh, one of the things about it is that he undermines it himself without waiting for anybody else to do it, so that he's much harder to pin down than, than anybody else. But certainly, uh, whatever, his, um, whatever his own uh, position on the subject, one of the basic things that organizes his work, what uh, could most loosely be called a critique of Western metaphysics, uh, and that he gets sort of more immediately from, from Heidegger's uh, uh, vision of the history of philosophy, uh, has to do with uh, the problem of something like periodization, or at least the problem of something like a history. That is, uh, uh, if we're in, if so-called Western metaphysics is a kind of area of thought in which we're um, imprisoned, uh, well, then uh, criticizing that is also, ought to also be trying to imagine something beyond it or something before it or going back or seeing whether one can go back and so on. Now, as I say, uh, the fact that this is Derrida's problematic, to use this convenient but, but sort of barbarous word, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that his answer to it will be a historical answer. In fact, I would assume that what Derrida, one of the things Derrida says is that there isn't any history in that sense. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, is a, it is a historical problematic. Uh, and I think that's the case with all of these, uh, with all of these other people. So that the first thing uh, that we can say about, um, about post-structuralism is that it represents the, the, um, the uh, introduction of, this, uh, of all of this linguistic, the, the, the confrontation of all of this linguistic, uh, um, uh, these various linguistic models uh, with history itself, with historical change and the problem of historical change. But it does this not just in the realm of thought, but also uh, in the realm of, um, uh, of reality, if I could put it that way. I don't know whether that's the right word to use in this context, but uh, in the, certainly in the realm of, of social life. Because this period, uh, 1966, 67, and, and since, uh, is a period in which all of these thinkers, uh, particularly in France, are precisely confronted with history. That is, uh, the immediate event without which none of this is comprehensible is May 68. Uh, and I think one must absolutely, uh, this is a book that's a year or two before that, but one must absolutely reckon May 68 into uh, the kinds of problems uh, which, um, uh, uh, which these philosophers are addressing on a theoretical level. Uh, although they've also pronounced themselves on politics and so on. But, uh, but we're, we're, we're seeing the effect of history uh, in, in the very categories and problems that they're feeling obliged to address themselves to. Uh, in our time, uh, or more recently than May 68, uh, there, is, uh, there is also a very fundamental political situation, uh, which you're surely all aware of, which is the, the possibility of, um, of the success, this less possible 
now, I guess, than it was a couple months ago, the possibility of, a, of, a, uh, of a, an electoral success of the so-called common program uh, of the socialist and communist parties in France, uh, and therefore uh, a perspective of, of, of a very different kind of political change in France. It's, it seems it's absolutely, um, uh, one can't understand the semantics of, of any of these books that we're going to look at without understanding that these are written in, uh, in that perspective. Uh, and uh, these books address themselves uh, to the anxieties uh, provoked by, some, by such a perspective, uh, a perspective then of the possibility of, 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 uh, of, of some kind of uh, concrete social or political change. Uh, and, uh, and, and thus, uh, all of these works, when they, when, they, when they deal with history, with theories of history, with dialectical theories of history, whether it's Hegel or uh, more occasionally with Marx, uh, that's, um, that is certainly a, uh, those are certainly theoretical problems which are dealt with on a theoretical level in their own terms, but they're also codings for uh, real practical problems, which is to say, uh, and to say it very fast, and I don't know that we'll, we'll come back to it immediately, but uh, to say it very fast, it, it, it reflects, I think, um, the, uh, the, the, the historical possibility of a, of, a, of a victory of the left in the sense that before, I would say, well, in the 20s and 30s, uh, I guess uh, France, in a way, invented politics and political intellectuals, and, and so all French writers have always been political. But in the 20s and 30s, the mass movements uh, were as much uh, fascist or right-wing movements as, uh, or mass movements of intellectuals. Uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, uh, groups, and so forth, as they were uh, left uh, groups. Since the, uh, since the uh, liberation of France after the occupation, it seems fair to say that almost all but the most uh, daring French intellectuals uh, automatically describe themselves as uh, being on the left, as homme de gauche. It's always homme de gauche for some reason. Um, and I think everyone who's had anything to do with French, uh, with French writing uh, since, the, since the Second World War knows that the, that the um, uh, admission of, uh, of Marxism or of left sympathies and so on is a kind of uh, automatic reflex in, in, all, uh, in all French intellectual uh, discourse. Well, uh, May 68 was in a way a kind of utopian climax of that because for a while, uh, everybody was an intellectual, and, um, and uh, there was a kind of uh, left uh, revolution in the mind or in, or in daily life, indeed, since everything was suspended and so forth. So in one sense, uh, that's a kind of culmination of, of, this, um, of these intellectual values, which are fed by myths of the, the various myths of the revolution and so on in France. But it seems to me that in the years after May 68, uh, on the contrary, uh, what you have is a, is the, is a uh, what can only be described as an agonizing reappraisal by, uh, by a lot of uh, intellectuals, by, by, by many French intellectuals who were before automatically on the left, of whether that's really what they had in mind, that is, uh, the, uh, the, the possibility of something like a, a common front um, uh, government. And uh, many of them concluded, since that's the moment in which uh, real politics begins to have a kind of effective gravitation on, on thought, uh, they suddenly realized that it wasn't what they had in mind at all, uh, that they weren't really left intellectuals in that sense. Uh, some of them decided, some of the, even the most radical ones decided that they didn't want an electoral victory by the, by the left, and so on and so forth. So at that point, then, uh, much of the intellectual baggage uh, that's, uh, that's implicit in, um, in this kind of theorizing has to be changed. Because at that point, uh, you can't continue to use uh, this in, these intellectual categories drawn from, from, a, from a whole very complicated and old uh, left uh, intellectual culture. Uh, but they have to be uh, somehow either done away with, replaced by something else, and so forth. And I think uh, this is not true Foucault has a somewhat different position, but again, uh, I think I would say of Deleuze, uh, the work of Deleuze, for example, of the anti-Oedipus, because his previous work is very technical philosophy of a very different type, uh, of the anti-Oedipus that uh, not only is it um, uh, an attempt to invent some new theory which would be radical, revolutionary, subversive, but not involve real revolution, uh, 
real political action of any kind uh, or, or any kind of uh, uh, adherence to or, or commitment to, uh, to something like the, the victory of the, of the Common Front. But it also involves something which is uh, maybe more interesting uh, for uh, North Americans, namely a very powerful kind of attraction by uh, the whole countercultural uh, ex experience here in, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the 60s. And a kind of, uh, I think one could uh, maybe, you know how um, both Hegel himself, I guess, and Marx said that um, German classical philosophy came into being because um, the Germans were too backward to have made a political revolution of the type of the French Revolution, so they had to do it in pure thought. Well, it seems to me that, um, uh, that in many ways it's very clear this is true. In all, I'm not just thinking of the counterculture in its most... Uh, 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 obvious ways, I think, of feminism and, and all kinds of, of things that have a much longer tradition here, it's clear that that's very new in France. Uh, youth culture was political in France and not countercultural. And this seems to me to be an attempt analogous to Hegel to invent in the mind uh, a, a system um, which corresponds to making this revolution, which in fact you haven't made in, in everyday life uh, since I think France remains uh, from that point of view, uh, much more um, rigid and, 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 and conventional than, um, than is the case with the, the, uh, with the results of the counterculture, wherever that came from and, and whatever, uh, whatever its ultimate social explanation was. So those are, those are some other uh, historical parameters of this, uh, this uh, post-structuralism, which I think uh, it's essential to... Uh, uh, to keep in mind because um, it seems to me that uh, this is demanded of us uh, by books which uh, want to be both um, eternal and true and valid in some systematic way and also uh, say something immediate uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in the contemporary situation that they were written in, which all of these, which all of these works uh, does. Uh, now, um, now, of course, our distance from that is that we're um, already, you see, not able to understand these things in their own terms, but we, we have to fill in a context and uh, interpret them and, and uh, uh, somehow uh, um, uh, rewrite them for ourselves in our own terms, since they are uh, essentially uh, foreign works in the sense of coming out of a situation which is not ours, and I think then that operation, again, I don't want to be too reflexive about this, but I think that operation is one of the themes that we have to reflect on uh, because I take it as one, or even for me, the, the central organizational theme of this course, namely the very problem of interpretation itself, uh, the problem of historicism, the problem of hermeneutics. That is, how do you understand the problem of hermeneutics has been uh, that of uh, interpreting the alien text, that is a text that comes down to you out of a situation which is not yours anymore in a language which is not yours, uh, but with which you want to entertain some, um, some relationships of, of uh, uh, both understanding and, and, and uh, other kinds of, um, uh, and truth, I guess one would say. Well, uh, it seems to me then that uh, the problem that, that interpretation has always posed, the problem, as you know, the, the, the history of hermeneutics uh, is itself a, 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 um, one which uh, is very much um, has fluctuated, assimilated into a contemporary one, that of that of early Christianity, uh, and in which, therefore, um, methods, uh, instruments, and so on had to be invented to transcode uh, or to perform a semiosis which is the, the Pierce word for the translation of one sign into another sign, one sign system into another, uh, in such a way as to make it available for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for people alive in, 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 a, in a very different kind of present. Well, what I've sketched here, I mean, I think these French things are not that distant from us, but nonetheless, I think that there is a hermeneutic operation involved, and that can stand, if you like, as a first kind of example of the problem and the theme of interpretation itself. Uh, what we've seen is that, uh, in a way, um, it's not even enough to understand these things from the inside. It's not enough to understand their position in a purely intellectual history. We also, when we've finished all that, we have to reinvent, reconstruct a whole social context in which, finally, these works are understood as uh, being uh, 
uh, gestures that have a kind of vibrant uh, human value, whether it be uh, one that you like or not, that's a different question, but uh, in which they have a kind of uh, existence, therefore, that's another word I could have put down here, as praxis uh, as well as, as uh, pure, um, uh, pure thought. Now, uh, I want to get back to the question of uh, interpretation, but I think before I do that, as we're getting short on time, I'm going to run through my, um, my list of things here, um, uh, if, just as a kind of preview, if, even if we don't have time to deal with it today. Uh, on the far left side, the scratches um, uh, are uh, intended to um, stand as kind of benchmarks or reminders of the following themes, which are in, I think, no special order here which are either key words that we'll be using a lot in this course, or key problems, or uh, problems that we'll be trying to grapple with, uh, which doesn't mean that sometimes we won't want to declare a whole problem a false problem, but, but rather that we may have to pass through that kind of area. And finally, uh, the kind of general, more general themes uh, that I'd like our discussions to, to, to address themselves to, if not directly, then in, some, in the indirect sense of a horizon. Uh, first of all is the question then of hermeneutics or of the, of the problem of interpretation itself. Uh, I'm going to say something about that. I will have time to say something about that in a second. But then uh, the word mediation and the whole practice of mediations. Um, uh, I've mentioned it before to give a kind of illustration. I would say that one can again take my example of post-structuralism as another uh, um, illustration of this, of this process. We, uh, we began by talking about, um, about uh, philosophical and theoretical texts in their own terms. Uh, in a, uh, and we made a kind of history of them which had its own, uh, now this is Marxist jargon more than even Hegelian kind, but it's useful, which had their own autonomy or semi-autonomy. That is, there is something like a history of ideas. Uh, Foucault does come after Lévi-Strauss. He was, did study with Althusser. Uh, it does make sense to say a little bit about Lévi-Strauss first. There is a kind of autonomy of this level of, of things. On the other hand, when we were through talking about the post-structures, we ended up uh, in um, uh, observations which have to do with uh, the political situation in France, with, with essentially kind of sociological view of uh, ultimately the French family, you know, uh, uh, why their uh, daily life is different from ours and so on. How do we get then from, how did we get uh, from, uh, a, uh, from one level of discourse about theory uh, to another level which has to do with uh, political events uh, or with, uh, or with uh, social, social groups and their, and their structure or, or whatever, or even the economic situation of France, which we could all, all, I've also mentioned the, the fact that France, uh, one of France's great world functions has been as an exporter of, uh, of artistic objects and uh, is now, I think, an exporter of theoretical objects, which are sort of have uh, succeeded on the, on the, on the list of, uh, of exports. And, and that, could have, that could be the beginning of a, of a, of a discussion of, uh, of, of these things on that level. Uh, the question is therefore not, it, maybe it's a little more complicated than I suggested by transcoding or, or even semiosis. That is, it, the idea is not to go from a philosophical level to a social level and that way get rid of the philosophical level and just talk about the social level or the political level. It's keeping the connections between the two. It's being able to think about developments in theory at the same time that we've also transcoded those into social terms uh, without letting go of what we said about uh, the, 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 the internal dynamics of, uh, of a system of thought, for example. Uh, if one could understand how this would, were done, then we would have an idea what mediations is and what the activity of mediating uh, is. Then I put the word periodization on here because that's our literary term for uh, for history, I guess, and for um, uh, explaining things to ourselves in terms of history. The problem's already come up a number of times. We've talked about modernism. What does it mean to talk about modernism, to make a period like that, to say that something new began and has ended and so forth? Uh, and, and, can, and, there, and there, too, uh, there, there are mediations. That is, um, is it possible that that, 
can that be immediately assimilated to periods of other kinds, that is political uh, developments or whatever, uh, or is it more complicated, or can we talk in these terms at all? And, uh, and several of the thinkers we're going to look at uh, really, I think, uh, conclude by, uh, by denying the possibility of periodizations of historical narratives like that, because that's what it is. Once upon a time, there was, uh, well, let's tell Foucault, once upon a time, there was the classical episteme, and then that fell apart, and then there was another episteme of the human sciences, and now uh, it's beginning to look as though that's falling apart and something else is emerging. We don't know what, but uh, it's a marvelous thing and so on. I mean, this is a story, right? As all history indeed uh, is a story, I've been persuaded by a, an important book of Arthur Danto, The Analytical Philosophy of History, that all, uh, that all non-narrative history, economic history, whatever, can always be recoded back in a narrative form. So essentially, if we believe in history or if we want to practice history, we have to face up to this problem, which is equally one of narrative as of, uh, uh, as of, uh, as of history itself. Uh, what, is it, what is the validity of telling stories about history, in other words, of periodization? Then uh, something else, I have here uh, uh, a note, uh, uh, sign systems, uh, which is sort of cryptic, uh, but what I intend to uh, uh, deal with in that, um, uh, under that rubric uh, is the idea of uh, what I just called and what Foucault calls the, uh, an episteme. That is, uh, if there is such a thing as periods, then what are they? What is their internal coherence? And you, the, 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 the possibilities range from, I suppose, uh, worldviews in a given period, a given worldview dominates, to the more modern sounding, at least, uh, uh, way of putting it, which is that each um, culture is a sign system. This is in particular uh, the, the, uh, the work of Yuri Lotman, the Soviet uh, semiotician, to whom we'll come back, uh, who has sort of put this, I think, most, um, most forcefully, this view. Well, can one then talk about periods in terms of sign systems? Or uh, is Foucault's a solution, but it's a solution he abandons later, is, it, is his solution that each period is dominated by an episteme, that is, whatever that may be, is that a, is that a form of, uh, it is, he says, an, an epistemological a priori, but it's not clear, as we'll see, what that might be, but uh, maybe that's something different from a sign system, and it's certainly, according to him, something different from a Weltanschauung, or a worldview. Uh, can we think about periods in that sense? That is, is there a kind of patterning process of whatever kind, however we want to describe it, at work in a given period, which somehow leaves its mark on everything in that period, on all of these levels we've been talking about, which traces out their, their limits in such a way that you only have certain structural possibilities and not others, and which then would enable us to mark the beginning and the end of a period too, because once, uh, once it's no longer there, then you know that something new has come into being. Uh, and. Um, uh, and, uh, and we've passed over into a new period. At, at least this is certainly uh, the, the other, one of the other fundamental issues raised by periodization, the problem of periodization raised by a book like that of Michel Foucault or, or by Luttmann's work, uh, and a question which will also permit us to, to I think, have a, 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 um, a fruitful dialogue with, uh, with some uh, semiotic descriptions too. Uh, then uh, a few things I have uh, written down, terms like homologies and isomorphisms or the adjective isomorphic, I'm not really sure what the noun uh, is. Uh, this uh, 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 will come back immediately to in, in Foucault tomorrow perhaps, but uh, the whole question of homologies is part of this previous problem. That is, if all these levels are patterned in the same way, then they are all homologous or isomorphic at least if that's different from homologous uh, well what is it what 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 would that uh, what kind of a process is that and and is that an adequate way of describing the relationship of levels to each other and indeed uh, does the very concept of levels make any sense and is that an adequate way of thinking about this which however we have to think about because particularly in our field since uh, ours is one which has been uh, aesthetics and, and works of art uh, whose very uh, effort has been to create their own autonomy and which therefore clearly uh, uh, ask to exist uh, in a kind of separation from uh, social life in general, from practical life, from, from history, from society. 
uh, in such a way as to raise the issue then of their, uh, of their connection to it. And finally, what I have transcoding that I've already talked about in everyday life, which is a phenomenological concept that, um, uh, that I'll want to say something about uh, later too. Everyday life, in a sense, as a, as a text. Okay, so these are some of the issues that I hope will, will, uh, will come up in the course of this, um, uh, in the course of these readings and these interrogations, both of theoretical texts and of, and of some of the works of art themselves. Now, the next thing I wanted to do was to list, and now that's from my point of view, essentially, uh, those, though that perspective. Now I want to give us the perspective of post-structuralism itself, and you may feel that it's abusive of me to uh, make this caricature of their thought, and I think it is sometimes a little funny, but, uh, uh, but I think uh, we're going to be reading them closely enough that um, once again, it's a, this is a self-correcting proposition. But I think, really, one can make a list of the things which uh, the post-structuralists don't like, which they think uh, are somehow, I hesitate to say ethically wrong, uh, so let me just say ideological and worth attacking and destroying from, uh, from a number of different positions. And I think one can get a sense of what's going on in these works, and I think then maybe you can get a better idea of how Foucault connects up to these people if I simply make you a checklist of the things that post-structuralism has set out uh, to, 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 to demolish or at least to discredit. From, uh, from, a, uh, from the point of view of aesthetics, uh, certainly the first of these things has to be representation. Now, what's meant by that in Foucault is a little bit different from what's meant in, in the Telkel group. I think for the moment we can just simply take it at its most banal level, uh, illusionism. Uh, and uh, the, the idea of a kind of a coherent uh, uh, aesthetic uh, world, whether uh, a, a filmic one, a, uh, a novel or whatever, in which you lose yourself, what Brecht called culinary theater or whatever, where you believe that it really uh, happens for, for in, in the kind of way that the suspension of disbelief operates, uh, and so on. So clearly the notion of representation already you can see is linked to to narrative, and uh, that presents some problems too, as we'll see. Well, uh, if representation is bad, then what's even worse? <laughs> and this comes out of uh, the work, essentially, of Roland Barthes, which is a very important precursor of all this too, is something which I wrote down here as nature, but which it would be better to call, in Barthes' terms, naturality, or naturalité. That is, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, attempt in whatever order of signs, whether in a novel, in an ad, in an ad by a philosopher, whatever, to um, convey the notion not only that there is such a thing as nature, uh, not only that there is therefore, consequently, such a thing as human nature, but also that a given historical uh, phenomenon is a natural phenomenon. That is, to eliminate time. Uh, or, in the case of the work of art, to eliminate, as they say, to, to efface the traces of production in the work of art so that you think uh, you're reading your novel, you think that's a perfectly natural activity and that, that the novel is a perfectly natural thing too. Nobody, if you began to think that your, that your mystery writer had to uh, f work out whether he was gonna have this character killed or not, how many characters he needed, then suddenly illusion is gone and, and the book doesn't work anymore. So you have to believe that this sequence of sent narrative senses is somehow natural. Well, these are samples of all the kinds of things which, uh, which the post structures attack, and which comes out of, in a kind of very distant pedigree, out of Brecht, you see, and, and Bach's work on Brecht. Uh, that is, out of uh, Brecht's idea that uh, one of the fundamental tasks of a revolutionary art is to show that things you think are natural are really historical. Uh, and so, in that sense, much of post-structuralism prolongs that, that impulse. Uh, then, an even more complicated um, object of attack, the subject. Uh, that is, the, sub the psychological subject, you understand. Uh, and uh, here, I think, it would be quickest to say, because it's too complicated to deal with now, be quickest to say that, in our terms, it would be the ego or the self or the belief in everything that has to do with what's sometimes loosely called uh, bourgeois individualism. That is the whole ideology of individual existence of, uh, of the, uh, which is ultimately comes out of 
the market and exchange and so on. The idea that every individual uh, is not only equal but kind of a center in his own right or her own right, a kind of substantive, uh, has a kind of substantive being, uh, which is to be thought of in terms of of an ego or a self, which then you integrate when it's in crises, you know, if you have an identity crisis, you solve that by reintegrating yourself and reacquiring an identity. These are all images of uh, not only what the post structuralists will call the ideology of the self, but they're also images which uh, are, uh, are uh, doubly suspect ideologically because they introduce another theme, namely that of centeredness or centrality or the center itself, which uh, now you can see is one of Derrida's great themes. That is the attack on the idea that there is such a thing as a center of reality, as a presence, that I'm present to something, that there is, that there is some kind of subject-object identity or that there once was or that there will be or, or, or whatever. So these things, presence and center, are also so many ideological motifs. Finally, the very notion of truth, you see, because if you believe in truth, it is somewhere, right? Maybe you don't have it, but someone has it. And there's a whole critique of the ideologies of science. Lacan has a series of lectures on the subject supposed to know, which is that of, uh, of, the, of, of the kind of optical illusion of, uh, of our belief. We know that we don't, our thinking is just sort of a flickering kind of inconsistent thing and in, in, uh, understood from existentially from the inside in terms of lived experience, but somebody out there has truth. That is, they think thoughts which are very different, have a solidity kind of present. Well, thus the very notion of truth itself and that it uh, is, is very much related to this notion of presence. Then some, some things which are very important politically and which may not yet seem to be uh, so closely related to, to these preceding ones, the notion of origin uh, and uh, the whole, and now we're, we're sort of moving from ideological motifs denounced by post-structuralism to methods themselves, uh, uh, the whole um, approach of uh, uh, what's generally called historicism uh, is uh, one of the uh, fundamental targets of, of post-structuralism. The notion of linguistic reference, that a word means a thing, uh, and finally, hermeneutics itself, uh, which is profoundly historicist after all. That is, even the way we were talking about the problems of interpretation, we were talking about uh, having some contact with the past as though there was a past that we could know in some way, uh, uh, as though we were uh, somehow reinventing, preserving the past. And finally, uh, and this is uh, a, a slogan of Althusser, but uh, is very clearly present in Foucault, humanism itself. Uh, now, in Althusser's case, this has to do with inner... Uh, with things within the Communist Party in this period, his, the, 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 uh, the tension between Gaudi and other currents in the, in the Communist Party. So humanism is a much more uh, local kind of slogan than it might seem to be. Uh, but, but, uh, but as we see, Foucault has generalized this into the whole notion of the human sciences, the human, uh, and uh, a kind of humanism which would be uh, the very... Um, uh, which would be the very foundation for, uh, for the sciences, as well as, in Althusser's sense, being uh, uh, the part of the ideology of, of the self, that is, that the human, uh, that, uh, that the, the individual human being has a kind of special, not only value, but, but is, a, uh, is an intelligible field of study in itself. Um, Okay, uh, so much then for the, the motifs of post-structuralism, uh, which I think you'll see at work in one way in Foucault and in another way uh, in, in other people. I think I've talked too long. My other, um, my other picture here, I'll try to do it better tomorrow, is uh, pick my version of what Foucault gives you a picture of here. This is his, I don't think his is very good. Mine probably isn't either, but mine makes more sense to me. Uh, it's his illustration of what happens when one episteme uh, is modified and becomes another one, and, and uh, I've, I've represented it here in that way, and I'll, I'll explain it tomorrow. I think um, uh, it's 10 of 6 now. I think we could have, uh, I would normally have more time for, for questions. I think we could have some questions or discussion now or interventions or whatever. Uh, questions, practical, theoretical, or on any other level, if you like. Or, or informational, because um, I'm, I'm not 
sure, I, I want to find out from you just to what degree I, I should um, extend the discussion of any one of these terms or themes. Yeah, that's a very astute uh, observation, I think. There's, it's certainly, uh, in part, it's only a certain historicism, but a very fundamental one that they're concerned with. Um, let, me, let me put it this, sure, uh, from, a, from the point of view of, of the problems of historicism itself, uh, it would seem that uh, one of the basic ones is a kind of absolute relativism in which, uh, since all epochs are immediate to God, as Ranke says, uh, there is no truth in this uh, scientific sense. And even within Marxism, as you point out, uh, uh, there, is a, um, uh, there is a tension between uh, uh, historicist Marxism and a, and a kind of, uh, uh, and another Marxist tradition of, of the science of history, which would seem to uh, be, involve a, a kind of um, discrediting of the notion of atemporal trans-historical science uh, and therefore be in, in this line. Well, I think what one has to say is that um, the, the historicism that, that these people are essentially uh, out to get uh, has the name of Hegel. That is, uh, what they don't like is not just historicism, but the notion of history as continuity. The idea that uh, history is a great stream in which uh, things evolve into, uh, not, not the Darwinian notion of evolution, although they mix that up, but the 18th century notion of evolution or of a great chain of being or something where, uh, where forms uh, turn into each other, new forms come out of the old ones, and thus where the historicists, uh, the historicist, whether he's Hegel or somebody else, sees his task as somehow recapturing this continuity which is, uh, which is somehow out there in the real world. Well, um, you can see again and again in, in, uh, in Foucault, but much more even in his book, The Archaeology of Knowledge, which is a kind of uh, prog programmatic defense of his method, the, the attempt, the, the, the repudiation of that and the, uh, the, the, the defense of an idea that of, of the radical discontinuity of history. That, um, that history is not continuous, can never be continuous, we can't understand it in this global way, which is a kind of, uh, after all, continuous history is uh, not unrelated to the whole problems of representation. If you or Hegel or somebody could somehow have a vision of, the, of history as a continuous stream, well, it would be a vision, and he'd be looking at something, and something would be represented in front of him, and so on. You see, so it's in that sense, it's in that way that the, that the theme of representation and the theme of this historicism uh, uh, is joined. I think it would be best maybe to, to give you Althusser's formula, because I think that, that sharpens the whole conflict. Althusser is attacking a Hegelian Marxism, that of Lukács, which says, uh, which is a kind of absolute historicism, which says, um, uh, the, uh, the proletariat is the subject, ob the identical subject object of history. That is to say, uh, each class has been a subject of history. And finally, um, uh, there is a continuity. History is a, is a continuous form which has various subjects of which this is the last one. In reply to this, Althusser says, history is a process without a telos and without a subject. That is to say, it's a discontinuous what? That is, it's non-representable. That's the point about it. So I would, I think that for the moment, the best way to understand this uh, this uh, polemic 
relationship between representation and his, historicism is that historicism claims to be able to represent the past somehow, tell a story of it in one way or another. And for post-structuralism, that's not what you can do with the past. But then if you can't do that with the past, is there a past? You know, is, is there really, uh, how can you say even of something that it was today's past? Yeah. That's a real problem, sure. If there's no past, what happens to time? Well, then, then little by little, there emerges a solution, a kind of time which is discontinuous uh, and uh, which is then emblematically uh, given, finds its kind of symbol in the schizophrenic and in the whole fascination with schizophrenia, which is a kind of human time, a kind of discontinuous human time, where uh, you don't, you don't know representation and you don't, uh, you don't put back together your personal identity every day in a kind of representational way. Uh, see, what we do when we wake up in the morning, we quickly remember our names, put our past back in order, uh, as Proust would describe it, our past comes whizzing around, attaches itself in the right place, and then suddenly we're in a comfortable kind of sequence again, which is a kind of narrative sequence. But of course, the schizophrenic not having an identity uh, anyway uh, can't do that doesn't th and and thus becomes a kind of symbol of this now lots of problems of course but that's that's the point of Yeah, I think that that's that's very good too. That uh, that um, th it's the future dimension which is somehow uh, the most politically suspect in a sense. That is, uh, this doesn't really arise for the present since we can't repeat it. I mean, we can say, you know, well, uh, history had to happen this way and invent a lot of theories of determinism, but uh, that really remains a dead letter since it did happen that way. It's never going to happen any other way, and so on. But of course, then what uh, what does emerge is the notion of I would, uh, predictability is maybe too scientific a word. A visionary, uh, a visionary way of conceiving the future, and I think it's there better than any place else that one can see how uh, some of these thinkers, at least, are trying to liquidate the Marxism that they used to have, because then at that point it becomes ideological for them, uh, even ethically uh, bad, uh, to um, to to live. Uh, Leotard's word for this, I think. Uh, it's a kind of strange way of putting it, but his word is a nihilism. That is, if you live for the future, you're living for what is not. Uh, and thus, uh, you're, uh, it's a kind of, also kind of Nietzschean, uh, although for, for Nietzsche, nihilism is a positive thing, but it's a, it's a way, therefore, of, um, of trying to devalorize any kinds of visions of the future, uh, which would come out of a, of, of a historicist view. And that's the other, I think, feature of the Althusser description. It's a, it's a process, history is a process without a subject and without a telos. It's not going to some place where it will stop. Uh, it, there is not some apocalyptic moment of subject-object identity which uh, we will arrive at. Uh, and, uh, and it's that which is attributed rightly or wrongly, I think wrongly in many cases, to, uh, to Marxism here. Uh, Foucault, which Foucault dismisses in a half a page as eschatological and so on. But I mean, uh, certainly that's, that's part of, that's one of the, things that the denunciation, uh, which is coded beneath the denunciation of historicism. Uh, and at that point, you have, uh, the result is that um, there is no point to political or social change because um, uh, there's an eternal return. I mean, everything is, is always the present. So why, why would you attempt to make some other present take its place, some future take its, take its place, when uh, the present is all there is? I think also there's something like this in the idea. 
but again, in Derrida, uh, it, uh, it, the implications have to do with the future, but the demonstration has to do with the past, that there never was a past. We think we're alive now, this must be the cutting edge of time and so on, uh, we're the, the, the end of all the generations. But, and thus we look back and we see, uh, we have these retrospective illusions, you know this famous phrase, I forget whose it was, uh, of a museum in which he claimed to have seen the skull of Voltaire as a child. Well, this is our, uh, this is sort of our view of the, of, of the past, that all of those things, none of those, that, but, but uh, clearly they were all presence too, absolute presence, and were no different, uh, and thus one can't even speak of qualitative difference. So Lyotard will say, attacking the Rousseauian post-structuralists who want to go, who still like to imagine tribal society, there is no primitive society. There never was any. All societies were exactly like this. All societies were capitalist. Or all primitive societies were capitalist. All capitalist societies are primitive. Yeah. So time is, is, is wiped out in that sense, too. Other, uh... Okay, I do want to say some things about uh, Foucault then uh, tomorrow morning, but also I'd like to get to uh, a few, um, to, if, if we had a little, little time to read a little bit of Flaubert uh, together. I presume we intend next week that we'll continue. In the yeah, same way. oh yeah, sure. Well, yeah. I. Well, I was saying, you know, the whole drug culture, the whole non-political uh, drug culture. Um, uh, uh, oh, sure. Well, yeah, take those yeah. synonyms now. Uh, uh, sexual liberation, uh, attack on the family, and so on. Yeah, this is all a kind of social practice that's existed here in reality, but which is really not existed in France, I think, until very recently. And, and, and the French family is different, there are a lot of reasons for that. So it seems to me that s at least some of those structures, and again, I'm thinking mainly of Deleuze, yes. in, is the theory of this practice that they didn't have, Apparently, where we don't, I suppose we have some philosophers in this, around or something, or even Deleuze in a way, but, uh, but nowhere near of these, of these proportions because we've had the practice. That was what I was trying to convey. More to the to the Hegel, line. right? Hegel and the French Revolution. I yeah, just have yeah. The introduction to, uh, to do. Be I have to find out what the modalities of the French department I are. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to use the French text and, and try as uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think our base uh, basic reference will be the uh, Penguin okay. translation, which I haven't looked at incidentally. So I hope. Any one of the stories. Uh, uh, just the first one. Okay. Across so I'll, have they reached? by satisfaction, or at least what it is, oh, yeah, disagreements oh, yeah. they think oh, are yeah. intellectual.